Uh, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 3, continuing our study. I told you last week it does get deeper and deeper and deeper in theology, but it's rich. And remember that Paul is wanting, he's really wanting to, as he said, give them a spiritual gift, which we think is the gospel, of course, to give them a deeper understanding of the gospel. Uh, so I think you'll find this an interesting uh, passage. I know you've all read it, but if you're like me, you read it and those words just kind of don't make a lot of sense, some sense, but <coughs> you have to kind of take it slowly. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Any questions, any comments before we begin? Let's pray. <coughs> Our God and Father, we ask your blessing upon us as we enter into this study of your word, uh, into this uh, study that takes us uh, to new dimensions, new understanding. Uh, at least it uh, intensifies it, and we pray that we may have understanding through the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and that understanding may enable us uh, to live closer to you, to live more like Christ, to trust more in you, and to see how glorious, how glorious your gospel really is, as Paul makes these comparisons and contrasts. So bless us in our study. May you receive glory. May we be blessed. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What I want to do is cover <coughs> 7 through 11. It's kind of a small bite. Uh, and I'm just, let's just read it. I will say before we get into it, uh, we have seen thus far that Paul will take a word, and I, I used the analogy last week of taking a wet towel or a garment and wringing it out and trying to get all of the, uh, the meaning out of it possible. You see, we started that with comfort. He uses that uh, ten times in one short section of chapter one, and then we looked at sufficient. He uses that three times, but he uses it uh, as three parts of speech, as adjective, as noun, and as verb. And you'll see what it is this week. Verse seven. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. You know what the word is. <laughs> Did you count how many times he used it? Ten times in this section, two more times in verses 12 to the end. That makes 12, 12 times. So what is glory? God's presence. Good start, right? God's presence. There's a perception of somewhere. Uh, Isaiah perceived something when he went into the temple. He perceived the glory of God. Um, it's very hard to, to define it. Uh, yes, and I, I, certainly Roy is correct. It's God's presence. But I think it's God's presence perceived. It's, there's something about God's nature that is perceived. Uh, welcome, Paul. Uh, and John and Jackie, welcome back. I know you all know we've missed, and we got a pretty good group for a rainy day. Here's my definition, which is probably not very adequate at all, but I'm toyed with it. Supernatural, meaning above the realm of the natural. You say supernatural, same thing, but kind of like supra, above. Transcendent excellence and splendor. Uh, 
perceived either subjectively or objectively. I put that in because sometimes you just know it's there and sometimes you see something. Subjectively or objectively and or attributed to God. Of course it comes from God. Um, and it should be attributed to God. I mean, even the beauty of spring, the beauty of nature has glory. The sun, moon, and stars, Paul talks about that. They have glory. They differ in glory. So glory is all around us to be perceived. And, yeah, I think, Roy, your, your definition is good. Come back to it. It's the presence of God seen in some way, hopefully acknowledged in some way. So hold on to that word, glory, used ten times here. From where does Paul get this, this scene he's talking about, this, this incident he's talking about? The Old Testament, right? Uh, about Moses. And Moses, yes. Moses. Uh, let me read you from Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. If you have your Bibles and want to follow along, Exodus, Exodus 29 and 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. After all the people of Israel came there, and he commanded them all that the, the Lord had spoken with him at Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Now, Moses, we assume, wrote those words in Exodus. He doesn't use the word glory. Paul does. Paul says it's glory. Uh, what Moses seems to be saying about himself here is that when he went into the mountain, they came back down, he didn't realize that his face was shining. And the people saw it, that his face was shining. And so he put a veil over his face so the people wouldn't see it. Uh, he told them all that God had commanded him up on the mountain. And he kept that veil on until he went in before the Lord in the tabernacle, as he would do. And when he was in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle, he took it off. He put it back on. He just went out and talked to the people. Off when he went in, on when he went out. It's a repetition. Uh, I got to thinking something about that. I didn't see this in any of the commentaries. But you remember in Hebrews, Hebrews is talking about how sacrifices have to be offered over and over and over and over again the high priest on the day of atonement because they really didn't take away sin and then Christ comes with a sacrifice offered once and for all and that ends it and I'm seeing this repetition on and off of the veil continually and then Christ comes and the veil, and we'll see this later is removed once and for all um there's a lot in there, a lot of symbol in this. May I suggest, as we get into this now, that he is going to, in these verses 7 through 11, he is going to contrast two ministries. Uh, the word for ministry is diakina. It's the word deacon. Deacon means a servant. Uh, Diakina is the noun form of it, service or ministry. You will see that Paul has already used that word. If you will look back at verse 6 of this chapter, God has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. Actually, that's where he uses the verb. He says he has sufficiented us. He has 
adequate is, <laughs> I can't use adequate as a word, he has made us adequate, we have to put it in English with made as, su sufficient or adequate, to be ministers, to be servants. He also is going to mention that in verse 3, you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. We are the deliverers. We are the messengers. We are the ones who dispense it. We, it doesn't come from us. We just serve it to you. That's the role of the apostle. That's the role of anyone who preaches. That's the word of the evangelist, word, work of the evangelist, to dispense, to give out what God has provided. And Paul saw himself in that role. So he has a ministry. And we have seen so far, and I'm going to back up, especially for those of you who have not been here the last few weeks, let's back up to the fact that when he, Paul went to Corinth, remember, this is just a quick review, there were problems from the first letter, you know, the first letter just filled with where he has to castigate them, he has to reprimand them, he has to point out their errors and their mistakes and their sins, and the whole letter just filled with it, and that can't help but hurt his relationship with them, especially when he has to say, take this man who's one of your members and deliver him to Satan because of his living in a sinful relationship with his stepmother. So uh, their relationship had been damaged of necessity. He wants to bring them back together because he spent 18 months there and he loves these people. He wants to repair the relationship. So he comes, he, he writes this second letter six months after the the first one. And in the interim, they have dealt with everything, apparently. He found out from Titus. Titus tells him uh, when he is in Macedonia that they, they have taken care of these problems. With one exception, they had not yet taken back the man in, in the fellowship and restored him, which they had to do. So he tells them to do that. So he's very happy. He wants to restore the relationship. And then he finds out there are people in Corinth who are gossiping about him saying things about him. They obviously didn't like him. And consequently, that was causing a problem in the relationship and in restoring the relationship. They were saying, you can't depend on him. He changes his mind. He vacillates, goes back and forth. And, and they were also saying, uh, we saw last week, you need a letter of recommendation uh, for him. Corinth should not, uh, the implication I think is the Corinth should not accept him until there's a letter of recommendation, or he should bring a letter of recommendation with him. You can see that back in verse 1 of chapter 3. So all of this was a problem stirred up by people who for some reason didn't like Paul. And they were... The problem is when they were saying these things about him personally, it was casting aspersions on what he was doing and what he was saying. If you can't trust the messenger, how can you trust the message? And so we saw that Paul jumps right to the heart of it when he says, by, by saying these things and demanding these letters of recommendation, by saying that I am vacillating, that I am fickle, and I'm changing my mind, you are neglecting, you are suggesting there's something wrong with the ministry, with what I'm saying, with the, the gospel that I'm giving to you. So he goes right to the heart of it. And we saw that last week. If you look at, uh, we read down to, to verse 6. If you look at the end of verse 6, he has made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And he goes right to this matter of the difference between letter and spirit. It is the same difference we see throughout. We see it in the Galatian letter. Works versus faith. What I do versus what God has done in His grace. This contrast. And you want to say, how do, how do you get there, Paul? What, what is there these people, gossipers about you were saying that suggests they were presenting a gospel or a message of letter, a message of, we might say, law, of legalism. How do you know that? Here's something I realized, I think you realize it also. Take all the religions in the world, 
take all of the interpretations of Christianity in the world. There are lots of interpretations of Christianity. You know, there are lots of, some of us were talking about this before class, there are lots of sects out there, S-E-C-T-S. There are lots of sects out there. There are, there's Arminianism, there's Pelagianism, all these isms that are, they are interpretations of Christianity. And you take that and put it with all the various Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, etc., 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 all the different religions. I'm going to take the position, and I believe it's right, if I am wrong, correct me, that of all of those interpretations of religion, there is only one that holds forth that salvation is by grace alone. And that is the interpretation of Christianity, the gospel that Paul preached. The gospel that we in this church embrace. Now, if, if I'm wrong, correct me, but I think that's the reason Paul jumps to this conclusion so quickly. You can't change the gospel in any way without winding up with a system by which man saves himself by doing something. And when you are talking about letters of recommendation that are necessary, there you are. And that's why he went immediately to this fact that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And, and, and we saw this comparison introduced last week. But that's where he's going right now. That, I'm giving you the background, so this is what you're going to look for here. Three areas where he contrasts a if you want to use the word gospel, it's really not a gospel. You know, it's not a gospel when you've got to do the work. It's not a gospel when at the bottom line it rests on you. And I'm glad it doesn't because I would mess up. We all would. If at the bottom my salvation was dependent on what I did, then I'm in trouble. And Paul knows that. So we have a contrast in verses 7 through 11 in three ways. Watch it. Now let's go back to verse 7. If the ministry of death, so he calls this the ministry of death, uh, and he is deducing from what these gossipers were saying about him that ultimately what they were presenting was a gospel of death, and they tampered with his gospel and in any way discredited it by discrediting him, then they're going to wind up with a gospel, a ministry of death. If the ministry of death and his symbol here, of course, is Sinai, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, carved on letters of stone. And of course, the Ten Commandments is good. We believe it, we affirm it, we'll be affirming it today in worship. But it doesn't offer salvation. In and of itself, of course, he expands it. You know that this is an interesting study in and of itself. The Ten Commandments can be expanded to all the commandments because all of them go back to the one of the ten the two tables of the law, and then those two go back to two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. Those two expanded to 10, expanded to 613. So if he speaks of these letters written on stone, you can infer that he's talking about 613 commandments. And the reason they're a ministry of death is you can't keep them. You know that the, the law requires you keep it perfectly. The law is good. It comes from God. It is an expression of God's will. We need to know what's right and wrong. But if we are going to depend on it for our salvation, we will fail because we cannot keep it. No one has except one man. And it is that one man, who is the Son of God, that we look, you see. So the ministry of death, carved on letters of stone, came with such glory. Now there's the word came with such glory. Yes, of course, the Ten Commandments is glorious. That the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit, there's the contrast, ministry of death, ministry of Spirit, have even more glory? Now, he expects that these Corinthians will understand what he means by glory. God expects, I think, that we would understand uh, it's perceived to some degree. I think we all perceive. Uh, it is the presence of God, perceived in some way. So, but the, the Ten Commandments has glory. It comes from God. 
and it was so glorious that it caused Moses' face to shine. That's an expression of the glory of the Ten Commandments, of the law. But he calls it here the ministry of death. I always liked when I would ask a student, uh, and I was trying to kind of take advantage of the opportunity in class to teach a little bit about grace, and I would ask a student, can you name one commandment that you have kept to, to please God? And of course, you know, come up with something. And then I'll say, no, you didn't. And I didn't commit adultery. Ah, oh, but did you lust after a woman in your heart? But I didn't kill, but did you have anger in your heart? And, you know, to, to keep a commandment perfectly, you have to keep it with all of its ramifications. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. We saw that. So, we have the difference between the ministry of death and the ministry of the Spirit. A couple of words to, to point out to you before we go on. Uh, it came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face. That word gaze means to stretch out and look. It's like the person is stretching his neck out to get a view, to, to see something. Could not gaze. And I imagine they did. Here comes Moses, and his face is all shining, and they see that, and they're stretching their necks out. What is that? And they could not gaze at his face because of the glory. Why could they not gaze at his face? You know, my, as you're thinking about it, I always thought because it's so bright, it, it hurts their eyes. They can't look at it. Paul has an entirely different interpretation. He doesn't say because it's too bright. Look what he says at the end of verse 7 which was being brought to an end. That's the reason they could not gaze at it. What does Paul mean by that? By the way, which was being brought to an end, which was being brought to an end is seven words. In Greek it's one. It's one word, it's passive. In other words, it's not bringing itself to an end, but God is obviously the one bringing this to an end. And what he's saying is, the veil was on his face so the people would not perceive that it is being brought to an end. And that is a little strange. But that ministry is a ministry that condemns them. And when they see it, they see condemnation. We've seen before, God gains glory by his justice, by his holy justice. And for some reason, God doesn't want them to see that. It's going to end at this point. See if we can deal with that more as we go along. Any questions? It's probably, where is this going? Let's go to verse, well, even more glory. More, this, I should say something about that. This idea of comparing the lesser to the greater. And when Paul does this comparison of lesser to greater, what he starts with is not really less. It is great to begin with because it's got glory. He starts with the Ten Commandments, a glorious thing. And then he's going to say, here's something with more glory. And as we go along, he keeps exaggerating that. He keeps intensifying that. Even more, surpassing glory. Verse 9. This is the second now. First one is death. To spirit and remember the spirit gives life so it's death to life the ministry of death versus the ministry of life second comparison verse 9 if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation see condemnation this ministry condemns because the law can only do it can only condemn it can kill it can it shows you your sin it cannot possibly forgive your sin it has no forgiving powers no remedial powers so this gospel, it's not a gospel, but this message coming, this ministry, this ministry will condemn you, which is all it can. Now, it's good to be condemned in one sense. It's good to realize our sin. We've got to realize that we are sinners before we can come to Christ for salvation. Luther said you always start with presenting uh, the law. Because the law will show a person's sin and then present the gospel that shows how we can be forgiven. So, 
ministry of condemnation, if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, and there was, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it. And here he uses a stronger word than he did in verse 8. Hooperbalo, like it's that word we've seen before, you take a ball and throw it up and over. I guess in this gym. <laughs> up and over, hooperbalo. You throw a ball. And so the, the ministry of righteousness far exceeds it in glory. So he starts with the glory of the Old Testament and says the, the, the ministry of righteousness far exceeds it in glory. So this ministry condemns any legalistic ministry, any legalistic ministry, ultimately at the bottom line is condemning and says, here you are and you've got to get out of this situation. You've got to do something to save yourself. And then verse 10, here's the third comparison. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Let me stop there, just in verse 10. He, he's stopping to say, again, glory, we begin with glory, the glory of the law, it has glory, and we go to what has much more glory, the glory of the gospel that I present. The glory of the gospel that you are destroying by suggesting that I am unworthy to present it. By saying these terrible things about me and, and causing the Corinthians all this confusion and trying to destroy my relationship with the Corinthians so they cannot believe, they will not believe this gospel. That's what you gossipers are doing. You know, he never names them. He just says some people at verse chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, he, he leaves them anonymous, but I, they are either Judaizing teachers, Christians who are Judaizing, who believe ultimately you have to have the law, or they are Jews, or they are pagans. I think one of those three, but it doesn't make a difference because they're all teaching you got to look to the law. So in this case, the word case is interesting. And the word case, it means a part, meros, part. In one part, in one part, okay, think of all of those religions, all of those variations of Christianity, all the sects, everything legalistic, in one part, no matter how good they are and how much is right in them, how much of the Bible is right, how much of the law they get right, no matter how much is right, one part is missing. And that's what he's talking about in verse 10. Indeed, in this case, this one part, and that part is pardon, is forgiveness, is being established as right with God. In this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. See? Because of the glory that surpasses it. And he uses even a stronger word. And now here's the third comparison. First comparison, death versus life. Second comparison, condemnation versus righteousness. Third comparison, verse 11, for if what was being brought to an end, and I told you to come back to this, this word, with glory, how much more what is, what is permanent have glory? The, diff the comparison here is what is temporary versus what is permanent. What is being brought to an end? And what Moses is, and what God, what Paul is saying here is the real reason that veil had to go there is God didn't want them at this point to understand that it was coming to an end. Not until they heard the gospel because they needed to experience the judgment of God. Uh, under that veil, God's glory of justice, His holy justice was glowing. And, if, and it was gradually just diminishing, fading away from Moses' face. If it faded away from Moses' face and they perceived that, I think the suggestion is, well, God's justice is not that much to be feared. God's justice is fading away. If that shining face symbolized God's holy justice. So he put the veil on him. You won't take God for granted. You won't be trivializing God. You will realize that it might be fading away, but you're not going to know that yet. You're going to realize you better 
you're going to experience God's justice, and that will drive you ultimately to the cross. That seems to be what he's doing with this verb coming to an end, which he uses three times. So temporary versus permanent. And, and just as Jesus offered one sacrifice for all that satisfies for sin, so there is one ministry that will not fade away. It is the only ministry that will endure. It will endure and it will bring righteousness and it will bring life, free things. Does it all make sense? It's, it's, it's deep, you know, I'm not saying it isn't deep. It is very deep. Comments? Questions? I think it's why Jewish humor is so dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take my wife, please. <laughs> And I think that he could not get them through this time. What was the motto of the Reformation? One of the mottos. After darkness. After darkness light. Post to neighbors Luke's. After darkness light. I remember when I was in Geneva and went in the chapel there at the church where John Calvin used to preach, and there it was still on the wall. Post to neighbors Luke's. After darkness light and I think Roy in reference to what you said that's why our life should be filled with joy all the time well that's verses 7 through 11 verses 12 through 18 just to tell you what's coming up he continues this and he says now let's look at the effect let's look at the effect of this on the Jews and then let's look at the effect of it on Christians and that's one of the most glorious passages in the Bible, I think. Coming up. Preview wants to go. Father, we pray you'll be with us now as we leave this class. We thank you for the time to study your word. Thank you that you have given us this word. Thank you for your spirit that helps us as we gradually come to understand more and more and in understanding to give you more glory. Be with us as we worship and may we worship in spirit and in truth and bless those who take part in the worship today. We pray in Christ's name.